Really glad to have you here this afternoon, and I expect we may have a few more folks joining us, but we'll go ahead and get started because I have a lot to talk with you about and want to say a special welcome to Regent Linda Shoemaker. Linda, thanks so much for being here, a member of the Board of Regents. So I have, as I mentioned, a lot to cover this afternoon, so I'm going to be referring pretty much to my notes, but we'll provide time at the end of this for more interaction with all of you. So uh, if you have thoughts or questions as I go through a lot of this, please make a note of those and uh, we'll talk about that after we finish. So, Let me just start by saying that it's been a great start to the new academic year. And uh, we've welcomed some remarkable new folks to our CU Denver community, whether they are faculty, staff, and students. And we've also had a number of really successful and fun fall events, including convocation, the block party, and just last week, the faculty awards luncheon and the groundbreaking of the Student Wellness Center. That was a great day for CU Denver and our students. The nine months since I've been here as chancellor have been busy ones, filled with many meaningful conversations and experiences. And I'm grateful for the part each of you has played in my learning. During this time, it's become clear to me that CU Denver is a very special place. The progress that has occurred since we became a standalone institution in 1973, including the growth of the Auraria campus, our joining with the Anschutz Medical Campus, and our more recent physical additions, including the business school, the student commons, and the development of the CU Denver neighborhood, are all milestones that mark the maturing of CU Denver. They are also indicative of the passion, commitment, and can-do spirit that characterizes each of you and all the folks who came before all of us. Today, I want to spend some time talking with you about what I believe lies ahead for CU Denver. If we are to fully embrace the unique position that we have in the Colorado higher education landscape. Additionally, I will share with you some of what came out of the more than 5,000 comments and suggestions that were gleaned during my Reach Out and Listen tour last spring, including the priorities that emerged and the early work that began during the summer. I'll also describe for you what I believe it's going to take for us to address a number of the challenges and opportunities that we face. Since arriving here, I've had occasions to speak both internally and externally dozens of times. I often cite what makes CU Denver distinctive and gives us a singularly important role, that is being Colorado's only public urban research university. For me, each word in that descriptor carries with it significant meaning. As a public institution, we are accessible, inclusive, and diverse. Our student body is arguably the most diverse among research universities in Colorado in terms of age, ethnicity, economic status, and family educational background. In addition, there are other areas of diversity where we shine when I think about our veteran student, for example, our international students that we bring together as well. Uniformly, our diversity is the element in which our faculty, staff, and students take mo most pride. With an urban focus and commitment, we address critical social and civic issues with the vibrancy and entrepreneurial spirit of the city we call home. Our locational endowment means that the community is truly our campus and its entrepreneurial and creative culture inform and inspire who we are and the work we do. Our research and creative activities are vital to the generation of new knowledge 
as well as to the learning experience. This focus, which creates new understanding, new technologies, and the potential for action, distinguishes us, particularly on the Auraria campus. And finally, as a university offering high quality degrees from the baccalaureate through doctoral levels, our work transforms lives and careers throughout our community and contributes significantly to Denver's culture and economy. I believe that it is the intersection of those four elements that not only defines CU Denver, but embodies us, or emboldens us rather, for even greater impact and stature than we might have ever imagined. What came through loud and clear on the listening tour and in subsequent conversations that I've had with many of you is that this community is ready and willing to create an even brighter future for CU Denver. Your input is being used to chart our course for the coming years. Here are the main priorities that you identified. First, you ask for leadership to establish a CU Denver specific, unifying aspirational direction. Many of you felt that this was long needed for this campus, and I agree. <clears throat> so building on what makes us unique led quite naturally to defining this ambition. By 2023, CU Denver will be one of the city's top five civic, cultural, and economic assets. Denver is rising as a world-class city, and CU Denver can be central in its lift. It's not a coincidence that 2023 will mark our 50th anniversary as a standalone institution. So how will we be known at that time? Imagine this. Prospective students say, CU Denver is my first choice. Employers say, we preferentially hire CU Denver grads. Economic developers say, CU Denver is vital to our success in retaining and attracting businesses. Entrepreneurs say, I got my start at CU Denver. Civic leaders say, CU Denver is our knowledge partner to help address the most pressing issues our community faces. Parents say, CU Denver was the best investment I could have made in my son or daughter's future. Our graduates say, CU Denver was key to realizing my dreams. The thing is, it's not hard to imagine that picture because we see pockets of it right now. But it's also true that many believe and feel that CU Denver has been standing in the shadows. I believe this is our time, and now is when CU Denver is poised to make its mark and secure its place as an undisputed asset in the CU system, the city of Denver, the state of Colorado, and beyond. And it's really no surprise that the rest of our priorities that have emerged are pathways to achieving this ambition. The next priority is elevate student success. This is our highest priority and one to which your collective commitment emerged loud and clear throughout the listening tour. And that's to improve the outcomes of our students. I will be talking more about this priority later, including specific actions we're taking and measurable goals we're establishing. The next priority is strengthen our position as a vital community asset. We have literally hundreds of connections in the community through work that our faculty, students, and staff are doing. In many cases, however, these efforts are disconnected, are largely unknown. We are inventorying what we have and identifying opportunities to coordinate, leverage, and create new partnerships where they can add value. 
Our fourth priority is advance excellence and innovation in teaching, research, and creative work. Of course, this is at the heart of our mission. In large part, the quality of our academic product is strong. That said, maintaining excellence and keeping up with advances requires more than just preserving the status quo. Identifying and working to secure much needed resources will receive a great deal of attention from the campus leadership over the coming year. Our fifth priority, create a more cohesive, collaborative, and inclusive CU Denver culture. Our campus comprises an abundance of talented and dedicated people. Our physical separation in numerous spread out buildings, coupled with the fragmentation of many of our systems and processes, have led to duplication, workarounds, and a sense that oftentimes we're bowling alone. Identifying and implementing ways to enhance our collective productivity and well-being will bring new life to the adage, together we are better. And our final priority is achieve long-term financial stability and sustainability. While money is not the answer to making progress on all these priorities, our ability to act on a number of them is affected by one of our biggest challenges, our financial situation. One frustration I heard frequently on the listening tour was the lack of resources that we have to work with, whether that's dealing with older buildings and equipment, not having enough financial support for graduate students or institutional aid for undergraduate students, or wishing for more funding for your unit or department to get the job done. I realize that this university has asked you to do more with less for some time now, and I appreciate the belt tightening that has led us to operate as efficiently as we do. But I want to speak with you frankly about the most important thing we can do to improve our financial con condition and outlook. In simplest terms, our budget is highly dependent on enrollment. In fact, 80% of our general fund budget comes from tuition and fees. We set the operating budget in the winter for the following academic year. When enrollment goes up, we have a working budget. But when actual enrollment doesn't meet projections that were made the previous winter, the budget has to be revised too frequently downward. This is what happened last year when the campus was unable to give base building raises or respond to many of your requests for additional resources. So to achieve financial stability, we need to do a few things. First, we need to increase the transparency with which we communicate with you about our financial situation so that you are able to see not only how your work is impacted by the bottom line, but how your work actively impacts it. This is something you suggested during the listening tour, and it makes complete sense. I have asked our new CFO, Jennifer Sobinay, to provide budget updates as we move through the year. She has already begun this by meeting with the deans, the finance directors at our schools and colleges, the cabinet, faculty assembly, and the budget priorities executive committee. And she will be communicating with the greater campus community as well. Next, we need to decrease our dependence on tuition by accelerating our efforts to increase other sources of revenue. These include philanthropy, grant funding, and other earned income. We're taking steps forward in this area by strengthening the partnership between our advancement team and our schools and colleges and other university units to identify individuals, foundations, and corporations who can and want to invest in our students and our university. We're working to grow CU online, as well as bringing more CU Denver courses and programs to South Denver. And we'll be looking at ways to increase our summer course offerings and monetize some of our other programs and services. In addition, 
we will be reviewing our budget model and considering how to align our enrollment goals with incentives to achieve them. I want to add that the CU system and President Benson have been incredibly supportive by directing considerable discretionary resources to our campus to assist with our capital projects, provide for one-time salary increases, and invest in strategic initiatives. As we take steps to address our long-term financial stability, for now and the foreseeable future, our financial future depends upon our enrollment. This year, we welcomed the largest freshman class ever for the fourth year in a row. That's really terrific, and I thank every one of you who had a part in making that happen. The truth is, though, that only tells part of the story because our pipeline to graduation is leaky, so to speak. Last year, 68% of our freshmen returned to us as sophomores, 68%. Our six-year undergraduate rate has ranged over the past five years between 40 and 46%. We must improve these numbers and quickly. So our final revenue strategy then is to improve student retention. For example, if we increase the number of students who return this spring, these students are already here this fall, if we improve that retention number by 2%, that will translate to an additional $1 million in operating revenue. Not coincidentally, that effort aligns with our highest campus priority of elevating student success. A key component to accomplishing this strategy is setting measurable and actionable goals. At their retreat this summer, I reported to the regents on how CU Denver is performing on a number of metrics that are related to the region's strategic priorities, including student success measures such as graduation and retention rates. We have set goals for increases in these areas that we want to achieve by 2020. Our goal is to improve to a 75% freshman retention rate and a 50% six-year graduation rate by 2020. I think it's clear that elevating our students' success and addressing our leaky pipeline are not only the right thing to do, they're the smart thing to do. And we've already gotten a jump start on this. At the beginning of the semester, the student services team began working to launch the Starfish Student Success and Retention Software. This software provides faculty and staff new tools to track and share information on student success. And students receive early alert notifications on attendance issues and academic shortfalls. Building on the work of the High Impact Practices Committee, the Office of Undergraduate Experiences has developed a great agenda for next Friday's Undergraduate Experiences Sympo Symposium, and I hope that you'll all attend. That's on Friday, October 7th. In addition to these efforts, over the summer, I charged four campus-wide working groups with developing improvement plans for different aspects of student recruitment and success. These were areas that came up through the listening tour process and emerged for me as areas where it was possible for us to make some um, progress on these very quickly. The first of the working groups was academic advising. The single most cited observation by students throughout my listening tour was the need to improve advising. Students told me that their perceptions were that advising is inconsistent inaccurate or incomplete, which often delays or discourages them in pursuing and completing their degrees. I know a lot of good work happens in the advising area, but it seems that we need to address how it is that we really pull that together. So I charge this working group with exploring how we can make a meaningful difference in our students' experiences with advising 
what an ideal advising process would look like here and what it would take to bring that to fruition. The second working group was K-12 pipeline development. This group was tasked with answering how we can become the university of choice for many more Denver area high school graduates and how we can coordinate and leverage our somewhat disparate efforts to achieve maximum impact and results as we, we reach out and work with school districts and individual schools. The third group was the Community College Pathways. This group was charged with defining a path for CU Denver to again become the university of choice for many more graduates from the five metro area community colleges who wish to pursue a four-year degree. Their work included how we could simplify the transfer process and what is needed to foster a welcoming, inclusive climate for transfer students. The fourth working group was around the strategic use of scholarship resources. One of the top reasons we hear from our students that they don't persist is the lack of financial assistance. Our ability to increase institutional aid is limited because of our current financial circumstances. So I asked this group to work on building the case for raising significant new resources for scholarships as well as identifying how we can assure that the scholarship resources that we do have are being used strategically to attract and retain the students who can most benefit from them. The composition of the four working groups was broad. Each included a representative from every school or college, as well as a student affairs representative. They used a design thinking framework from our own in-works and were guided in their work by John Bennett and Regina Kalkenny. The teams were ably led by Laura Argus, Kelly Hupfield, Sarah Fields, and Chris Dowen. I'd like to ask all of the members of the working groups who are here this afternoon to please stand so that we can recognize the work that you've done over the last two and a half months. Please stand. And indeed, they did yeoman's work, reporting two weeks ago on their recommendations for both short-term and long-term actions. They have developed bold, ambitious, and boundary-busting plans to create new value for our current and prospective students while simultaneously reducing the complexity of making that happen. Their, recommend their recommendations will drive important next steps. Some are relatively straightforward and can be implemented with minimum disruption and dollars. Others go much deeper and call for more significant change and investment. I'll be meeting with the deans and other campus leaders on these issues, hopefully as early as next week, to discuss the recommendations and make some decisions about how to proceed. So stay tuned as we'll have much more to share about how we're moving forward and implementing the work of the working groups in the coming weeks. While it's true that we face some challenges, particularly our financial rel reliance on enrollment, it's also true that we are providing something that is essential. In a world that is changing in a way that higher education is less a luxury and more a necessity than ever before, we are all part of something that deserves our very best efforts. This starts, of course, with our students, their success is our highest priority, and meeting their needs will require a holistic and an individualized approach. We heard on the listening tour, through the administrative prioritization process, and numerous times in between that our students too frequently have a difficult time navigating their way to receive the services that they need to succeed here especially services that involve more than one university unit. Certainly many of our students have an excellent experience, but there is also room for us to improve. Some of you may recall that I grew up on a farm in northeastern Colorado, so I speak with some authority when I say that silos belong in farm, on farms. 
not in universities. So it's incumbent on each of us, every one of us, to do a better job, not only attracting students to CU Denver, but delivering the ideal student experience so they get what they need to succeed and graduate here. And that applies to both undergraduate as well as graduate students. This is a cultural shift from treating students as if graduating is their responsibility to our sharing collective responsibility that they achieve that goal. In every interaction with each student you come across, I am asking each of you to see to it personally that our students get the support and assistance they need. Rather than simply completing a conversation or transaction, I want you to take that one step further. I want you to ask, is there anything else I can do for you? And then do what it takes to respond to their need, whether it's answering a question or directing them to someone who can. In many instances, that someone who can may well be at the Lynx Center, and so uh, that's a great service that we have, but in other instances, it may be needing to direct them to someone else. I promise you, if we do that, we will delight our students and probably amaze ourselves. In summary, you spoke, I listened, and together we are setting the university's destination. I started and will end with what makes CU Denver a very special place, our distinctive role as Colorado's public urban research university and our collective aim to become one of Denver's indisputable exceptional assets. We have come far in just over four decades of existence and we are well poised to move to the next level. In the coming weeks and months, we will move forward with the next steps, weaving together our priorities and the recommendations from the summer working groups with the Board of Regents metrics and refreshing the strategic plan that was developed in 2007. Yes, we have work to do, but I have no doubt we are up to the task. It is my honor and privilege to be serving as your chancellor at this exciting and important time in the history of CU Denver. I thank you for all that you are doing and will continue to do to make CU Denver preeminent. Before we get to your questions, I'd like us to view a short video that reminds us of the difference that our collective work makes. It features seniors and graduate students who have navigated CU Denver well and are thriving, sharing their perspectives with incoming students. Dear freshmen. Dear freshmen, I'm writing this letter today to congr congratulate you on this next chapter you're taking in your life. You have the privilege of entering an institution which allows you to live in the real world. CU Denver is a special place. There's really no campus like this anywhere between Los Angeles and Chicago. This is a unique institution in terms of the sheer amount of different opinions and different voices that you can hear on a daily basis. Coming from a low-income, first-generation background, it was never expected for me to go to college. And I was in this dilemma where I was on the verge of dropping out the very first week of my freshman experience at CU Denver. But CU Denver, along with my family, was there to help me turn things around. CU Denver has given me the opportunities of a lifetime. This campus means so much to me. What's awesome about the fact that you've joined CU Denver is that you're going to learn how to become a person of the people. We are literally the heart of Denver. The amount to which this campus is inclusive of people's lives, not just necessarily treating them like students exclusively, but full human beings. That I've never found that at any other school, and as a grad student I've been to a lot of schools, <laughs> too many perhaps. I was offered one of two full ride, all expenses paid scholarships to a prestigious private school, but it lacked a sense of immersion in the real person's experience and in a connectedness to the global community and the community that is downtown Denver. This is my time to truly search for the things I am happy for or what I am passionate about. This is our home. This is our home. 
This is our home. This is where we learn with purpose. And this is CU Denver. I can't decide whether that tugs on my heartstrings or gives me goosebumps, a little bit of both, I'd have to say. But that is a wonderful reminder of um, why what we do really does matter. So I thank you for your part in making those kinds of experiences possible and how we will assure that every student who comes to CU Denver has a similar result. So with that, I'd like to open it up to your questions and um, have a little more interaction with all of you. So please, do we have a, a mic that we're gonna use? Okay, somebody's got one, so. Uh, yes, Marjorie. Okay. So she asked about refreshing this uh, strategic plan and what that process is going to look like. Well, as it happens, um, and um, Regent Shoemaker is actually the chair of the strategic planning committee for the Board of Regents. And we have been asked by the end of business today actually to uh, share a little bit of framework uh, moving forward to, uh, in order to feed to the Regents process because they are looking at wanting to develop a high level strategic plan for the CU system. And they really want to draw on our, uh, our plans from the various campuses. So many of you who have been around for a while know that there is um, a strategic plan that was developed in 2007, approved in 2008, that was a plan for 2008 to 2020. So what we have done as we look to refresh that is to take a lot of the input that came from the listening tour, the work that has happened in between now and then, looking at, at what the priorities are, uh, the region's metrics that have been uh, established since that time as well, and, and kind of pulling all of those together. We have crosswalked the work that's going on right now with the strategic plan. Um, to make sure that the efforts as we move forward with putting all of this into action is really reflective of that. I'm thinking, and we need to spend more time kind of flushing this out, uh, that we um, will have broader conversations with the campus community to say, these are the priorities that uh, really came from all of you. So I think they resonate, but how we move forward on them, we need to be pretty inclusive in how, how we um, do that. So our hope, and um, I, Linda and I spoke on Friday afternoon, and um, the hope would be that we, by the end of this calendar year, will have done that work one of the things that I think is critical in that, that we identify what it is that we're going to measure. What are the metrics that we're going to hold ourselves to? And as um, Terry Potter, who um, many of you know, has played a key role in uh, developing our strategic plan, as he and I have talked about it, that how do we really um, take what we have, look at the original strategic plan and uh, identify specifically how it is that we're going to know of the progress that we've made, as well as assigning accountability for who does what, because that's a key part, as we know, in, in order to measure progress is who, who, there are a lot of people that feed into a lot of these things, but um, where is that accountability going to lie? So that's kind of what I have in mind, and we need to talk more about what the process really looks like. Uh, but there will be anyone who um, is just itching to get involved with that, uh, let, let us know. <laughs> Good. Uh, Marjorie, <laughs> we've got our first volunteer. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, Brenda, did you bring that dark chocolate so that we can get a little caffeine going here? <laughs> Oh, yeah. oh, oh, hey, look at this. Uh, so anybody who asks the next question, I'll share my chocolate. <laughs> 
Well, let me just tell you a couple of things that came out of this morning's um, discussion. They were there at 8 o'clock, and I don't know whether, um, you know, it, uh, the early morning or, or the late afternoon that there is a, a lot that um, of energy that was in that group as well as this group. You have a question, so please go, to, go ahead to the mic and then I'll fill it. No. All right. Okay. Well, that, I'd rather have it come from you, so you go ahead. Thank you. Uh, the, my name is Soyan Bueno and I work for the Educational Opportunity Programs. And thank you so much for the overview. I think it's been very insightful. And I think some of the questions that we have, given that our population of students is more diverse, and as you clearly stated it, and retention is one of the key factors that we don't have a, um, a, you know, a robust graduation rate. What are some of the support services or resources that you will be giving to centers that really focus on our diverse population? Has that been a, a part of the conversation or a part of the consideration? That's uh, an important and a tough question, uh, frankly, because as you see, our ability to have a lot of discretionary resources or additional resources at this, point, at this time is really limited. So, what I would say first and foremost that we need to do is that we need to utilize the resources that we have in the very best way possible and none of us ought to be thinking that that's our responsibility alone. That while it is incredible to have the kind of support services that are provided by EOP, those students are students of the university as well. And what is it that we are all collectively going to do to utilize what we do have? So it is a matter of, I think, um, us maybe just thinking a little differently about how do we align our efforts, and that's why I'm, I'm uh, really highlighting that the support for our students' success and that every one of us has a, re a role and a responsibility in making that happen. I know that's not um, the answer that you'd like to hear or maybe others would like to hear, uh, but and so it, it's one of those uh, chicken and the egg, if you will, that how do we do what we need to do with um, the resources that we have that allows us to do more. One of the things that um, I've talked to Jennifer Sobenay about is really looking at our financial situation. Um, and it's been incredible because Regent Shoemaker and the other regents as well as the, the CU president have said, you need to let us know what it is that CU Denver needs in order to do the work that we're doing. I mean, we know that for this freshman class, I think it's right around 40% of those students are uh, first-gen students. It's the most diverse, um, it maybe mirrors uh, pretty much last year, but 58% of our new freshmen are students of color. And so when you look at what it takes to support those students, I think there is an openness and a willingness for us to say, you know, how do we look at this? And so I don't know what the answer is going to be, but I've asked Jennifer to do some pretty deep looking at um, the resources that we have and the possibility of other resources. And then some of the other things that I mentioned in terms of how do we provide, um, you know, build the case really for more external investment in CU Denver as well. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Rebecca Hi. Hunt, History yeah. Department. We're doing an initiative to reach out to K-12 and also to community colleges within the History Department. I suspect other departments are doing the same thing. How do we figure out in the working groups who to link to so that we can make this a unified effort? Yeah. And that's, that's exactly, exactly uh, Rebecca, the work that uh, that working group did. And it is, it's really pretty astounding to me how much we have going on out there. But 
the K-12 group particularly, and I don't know if there's anybody here uh, that was in that group, um, and Marjorie, maybe you could uh, augment this. They did a pretty uh, remarkable job in a very short period of time reaching out to K-12 students, to um, counselors, to parents as well. And um, what they found was that folks in general didn't know what was happening within their schools that, that we were doing. And so there's something wrong with that. So uh, I think as we move from the working groups to the action groups, I don't know if that'll be the name of them or not. Somebody said they ought to be the happening groups, but uh, whatever. Uh, that um, I think that you know those working groups had representatives from your various schools and colleges. What we didn't have, perhaps, was a, a deep enough dive into individual departments, Marjorie, probably to really um, inventory what was going on. And there's an um, eagerness and a, a real desire on the part of, you know, certainly DPS is uh, right here. Um, that we are immersed with them in so many different ways. But it truly is part of that silo that, um, you know, it's not coordinated, not leveraged. And, you know, there's, there's no doubt about it that the, um, what's that old line about, you know, the, uh, the sum of the parts, what's, what is it? The, greater than the whole. It's almost five o'clock on a Monday <laughs> afternoon. Sorry about that, yeah. But anyway, that's the point. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm Ashley Cooper. I'm in Student Affairs. Um, as you were talking about, um, you know, student retention and graduation as one of our big uh, efforts that I know we all are striving for, um, and really breaking down silos, I kind of, like, in my head, I think about sort of the division that we have between academia and student services, and have there been any conversations around, like, looking at student success at a higher level and, like, that student life cycle management, how we might be able to kind of break those barriers down? Yes. There was a lot of conversation, I think, at the working groups uh, about that. And I remember folks talking about having student success teams that would draw from both academics and student services. So how, how we actually move in that direction is a, a question that I need you all to help um, advise and, and um, really put in place. But I think it is that notion that it's going to take all of us. It does take all of us already, but how can we do that more efficiently and effectively? Well, you've covered most of what came out of this morning. I might just uh, add one more thing because um, it may get a little bit of buzz and I want you to feel like you, you heard it here and it uh, wasn't just secondhand. Somebody asked the question, and this really came out of the K-12 working group. There was quite a bit of conversation about reclaiming the CU in the city as being something that was around a number of years ago, and um, some of you may have the, the history of that, and uh, it wasn't to diminish at all, learn with purpose, because that has great meaning and significance uh, to us as well, and really went a long ways in, uh, I think, establishing a message that's a pretty um, significant one. So we are looking at with the university communications team of how we might marry those together. Uh, I mean, it seems to me that they could coexist in some way that see you in the city where our students learn with purpose, you know, is an easy way. But there was such energy around that notion of see you in the city. And I was sharing this morning that in the time that uh, since that was 
talked about in the reports out from the working group, I've been gifted with um, several uh, different gifts that must be in folks' bottom drawer or somewhere. <laughs> that one of them is a, a set of coasters. <laughs> Another was a package that uh, Bob Damrauer, and uh, if any, uh, many of you know Bob, he's been here for a long time, that I had this cube on my desk that was wrapped in a white paper with masking tape, and it said, to Dorothy from Bob, and I opened it up, and it was one of the, um, the stacks of post-it notes that was the, that, uh, the See You in the City uh, theme on it, and he said, uh, they're really good, good paper, Dorothy, and I said, um, <laughs> So why are they still wrapped in cellophane? And he said that this was the memorial one or something. And then um, Mark Ingber, I just got today a beautiful mug that uh, is part of the engineering program. Mark, what is it? You've got a, a great way that you tie it all together. Engineering at 5200 Great. So, um, a, a, a nice mug, so if any of you would like to see those, and um, <laughs> I'll share a little bit, maybe off of, off of the, the, uh, the pad of paper anyway, but uh, so anyway, that is, that is getting some conversation, and um, like I said, I, uh, if you hear rumblings about that, that, that's what that's about, and it really came from the bottom up. And somebody had said that they thought that we had been, um, prohibited from using that, and it was just last Thursday at the Student Wellness Center groundbreaking that uh, President Benson was here, and I said, uh, would you have any objections if we were to reclaim that? And he said, why would I? Isn't that who you are? So I think we've got a, a pretty clear road to be able to use that. So There's a, a question over here. Yes, please. <laughs> okay. I just thought it might kind of wrap it around an, uh, uh, an experience I just had on Saturday. I was wearing one of the CU t-shirts after taking my yoga sculpt. I live in north, north of Boulder, uh, sorry, north of Denver in Broomfield. So this is all the north, northern neighborhoods. So I've got my CU shirt, t-shirt on after taking yoga sculpt in Louisville. It says uh, home of the brilliant, I think, on the back. And uh, my first encounter was a yoga teacher who just said, oh, CU, I went there. Right away, she's thinking Boulder. So we have this conversation about, well, no, I'm, this is Denver, and so a little bit about Denver. Then I go get a, uh, now you get to learn all about my Saturday. So I go get, <laughs> then I go get a mani-pedi right across the street. And uh, the woman who was, <laughs> working on me there she says oh my son he's in high school he's a senior he's just applied to see you she noticed my t-shirt and i said well is that see you denver oh no boulder so we have a conversation about engineering in, in denver uh and then i'm off to costco <laughs> and uh that's in superior and uh some man stops me and says what is this you know i keep seeing some things about see you and so i explained kind of the the, um, the campaign we have here and to kind of put us on the map here. And he says, oh, you're not talking about Boulder? And I said, no, <laughs> this is Denver. And, and he said, oh, I just saw something about Boulder and it's the most beautiful campus in Colorado. I said, well, we're a beautiful campus. We're in beautiful downtown Denver. And then I did all this, you know, with my shopping cart right there. And so I, I think there is, I mean, I would love to be wearing a t-shirt that said, see you in the city, because yeah. then it might be a little easier yeah. to be sharing, especially up there in the north, you know, no, see yeah. you Denver, you know, right. your son could try to also apply to see you Denver, and that kind of thing. So yes, well, nice. thanks for sharing that. And, you know, that's why um, I uh, spent some time talking about what it means to be the state's only public urban research university because I do think that that creates a distinctive picture and a niche for who we are and who would choose to come to this environment. Uh, many of you that if I have run across you in the elevator or walking across campus or whatever, you know that I'm not bashful about starting up a conversation. And so I do that a lot with students. And I love to ask them, why see you Denver? 
And one of the things they oftentimes first say is that they love being immersed in the heart of a dynamic city. It's not uh, either it, they lead with that or they talk about, I love the richness of the diversity that this campus represents. And then they talk about the quality of what they are getting here. So I think we have a story that we ought to be proud to put, proclaim, and it's about time. So with that, I'm going to wish you a good evening, and thank you for coming, and thanks for all you do and will continue to do.